All righty. Thank you for that. Let's check out the results of this one. Okay, interesting. Yeah, that's uh, that's that's an interesting split for us. You know, as we've we're about a couple months in here into uh, launching our F2F genetics network uh, and and the conventional corn that we have to offer this year, and uh, we've been surprised. You know, thus far the majority of our sales have come from people that you know by our records hadn't grown conventional corn for quite some time. So it's really interesting to see the number of people that are uh, are deciding to jump in and and uh, try out conventional corn, maybe for the first time, maybe for the first time in uh, in 20 plus years. Um, but today we're going to unpack the why, right? Why are people considering this, and what does it look like from an ROI perspective um, when you when you compare traded corn to conventional corn? So that's that's the topic of the day. Um, I'm going to kick it over to to Ron, who is uh, who's going to just kind of introduce kind of this topic and uh, and give some insights from what he's heard um, while he's been out and about in the fields um, talking to farmers who are, who are growing conventional corn. So, Ron? Hi, good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, for some of you, uh, hopefully you're able to have uh, some dinner while we're going through the webinar. Really, really appreciate uh, the commitment of your time uh, to uh, learn more about conventional corn. As we look at, uh, at, at uh, what's going on in F2F genetics, um, we've had uh, just uh, so far great progress with our order position. As you know, a couple of soybean varieties are sold out. Uh, the business is moving forward quickly. And uh, But one, one area that's really shocked me the most is the number of farmers that have been farming traded corn that are ordering conventional corn. So right now, about 80% of our orders are from farmers that have been farming traded corn uh, and, and are now going to try, uh, try conventional corn. And so we're going to spend this evening to, to, as Brent said, to unpack that and to help understand why those numbers and economics work. Uh, this week, uh, I spent Monday and Tuesday traveling with, with a couple of our account executives talking to farmers about, about this topic exactly. And uh, it, it's always amazing to uh, when we call on farmers that have been farming conventional corn or maybe some conventional and some traded and the amount of confidence that they have that they can do it. And uh, also sometimes even as they as they sort of joke about uh, why farmers just assume that they need to spend all the extra money on traits. And we'll talk about uh, some situations uh, that, you know, maybe maybe traded corn is your best option if it truly is. Uh, then we want to make sure that you can make an informed decision about that. But we really want to challenge you to think about the economics. Um, at this time in agriculture, with the uh, tariffs that have been put in place, with the challenging commodity prices, it's, uh, it's really important for us at Farmers Business Network to, to do all that we can to uh, help you have the opportunity to get more profit. And so as we go through this evening, uh, I would urge you to ask questions. Uh, you'll see uh, there on your screen. Uh, the ability to type in questions and uh, we'll both address those as we go as well as at the uh, at the end of the presentation so i uh, hope you enjoy this uh, we also look forward to your feedback if there's uh, questions that you have around things that we didn't cover tonight or comments you have that we should cover in the future we would be glad to to address those topics so thank you so much and uh, brent uh, let's uh, let's get in let's get into it great thanks ron all right, so um, let's uh, let's jump ahead in the slides here, and uh, you know, just want to cover what we're going to go through today. Um, you know, we're going to start off really, I, I say, at the macro level, where we're going to talk about conventional corn and its ROI uh, from from like a macro level. So we have a expansive data set here at Farmers Business Network, and with that, we're able to look at what are what are the yields of conventional compared to the different traits traded corn that are out there and then how does that compare to the cost so we're going to start off really at the high level um, and talk about that and and then we're going to start to jump down and we're going to talk more about how, how does this affect your farm so first of all we have a, a recording queued up from a previous webinar that we did where one of our farmers from nebraska uh, jumped in and, and kind of talked about his experience growing corn um, we're going to play that again today, um, and then we're going to jump into a little bit more specific ROI. So, you know, we're going to actually actually pencil it out, and we're going to look at both seed costs and chemical costs, and talk about what is what does net revenue end up looking like when you compare all things considered conventional corn versus traded corn. Um, so we're going to go through that, um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the offerings that F2F Genetics Network has this year. 
um, and things that uh, that we can do that we think will help help out with uh, you know corn profitability this season. So uh, let's jump to the next slide. So let's talk about you know some of the the main objections are going to be kind of across the top. But this is like I said, looking at the at, at the FBN database. We have a big report that's going to be coming out shortly that talks about trait ROI and how are traits actually paying off uh, for farms, farmers in our network, uh, based off the data that we see. Right. So at FBN we have um, we have access to to see how conventional versus traded corn performs in the field from a yield perspective, and then also because farmers you know share and benchmark their pricing. We also are able to to look at the overall pricing of conventional corn versus traded corn, and with that, we can we can start to develop a really good ROI story, um, and that's what I want to unpack here first. Okay, so the first the first kind of objection that we hear a lot when it comes to conventional corn is that conventional corn doesn't yield, and you know this is this is an interesting one for us um, because we have a lot of data to look at it, right? So if you look on the right, uh, we have that all the data in the FBN network, which is millions and millions of acres across multiple years, you can see that conventional corn versus traded varieties are nearly the same. You know, we're talking within within a couple percent here, um, and and really close, 171 compared to 174. And you know, this kind of tells a story that we hear from farmers, right? Which is that conventional corn versus traded varieties, if you can manage the pests, uh, perform very similarly. I mean, in fact. You'll hear from Dale that you know some of these some in some situations we'll see conventional outperform uh, traded varieties if if you can properly manage the weeds and manage any bugs. Um, so I think that's really interesting to look at from a macro perspective how close the two are. Um, and then as we jump down to the the spe field specific level, um, we'll talk a little bit more about about why that is. Now on the right, then you see the price. Okay, so this is the price per bag, price per unit of conventional corn versus traded varieties and you can see it's an expansive number right um you know it's it's a uh, it's a number that that definitely doesn't shows shows the roi that we're gonna we're gonna dive into here um, over the next couple slides so let's jump to the next one all right so now let's go trait by trait and this is again looking at the fbn data set um and uh and and how how things have performed so the first one is Glyphosate tolerance. So, you know, one of the objections that we hear a lot with regards to uh, growing conventional corn is that I need to spray glyphosate. Um, and, you know, I honestly say at one time, I think that was a very fair argument. Um, but as we all know, uh, glyphosate has started to build up some resistance. And what we're seeing after talking to farmers is that a lot of farmers are only using glyphosate. Uh, to manage maybe the grass, maybe just as an ease of mind. Um, we're finding that a lot of times because of weed resistance, farmers are having to change up their chemical programs anyways. So what you see here on the slide is comparing both yield and net revenue per acre or ROI of glyphosate tolerant corn versus conventional corn. So on the left, you can see that the yield effect is pretty negligent right uh, you know what we're comparing here is glyphosate corn compared to conventional corn uh when when you look at corn back to corn and when you look at you know corn and soybean rotations and you can see that on corn back to corn we do see a difference about five bushel an acre uh difference in yield where glyphosate tolerant corn does outperform which there's a lot of factors that could go into that uh but then you know right beside it we see that on on a rotation of corn and soybeans there's actually a negative, right? There's actually a negative yield uh, of glyphosate tolerant corn when compared to conventional. So conventional corn actually outperforms in our data set. It actually outperforms uh, glyphosate tolerant corn when it's on a corn and soybean rotation. So that's yield. Uh, how does this affect net revenue? Okay, so the ROI you see here is, is net revenue of, you know, your, your uh, revenue minus your seed costs. And you can see that it's pretty expansive for, for both rotate, for both corn on corn and corn and soybean um, offerings or, or rotations that, that farmers have. Um, and it, it becomes pretty, pretty substantial. Now, I do just want to iterate that all this data that we're going through is, is uh, based off our data set. Results may vary. Um, and, uh, but we just want to analyze what we're seeing um, as, we, as we unpack these numbers. So let's, let's go to the next slide. 
All right, so the other objection we get is that I need my corn board protection, okay? And, and this is an interesting one that we're gonna unpack a lot more when we look at you know on-farm ROI. Um, but looking at it from a high level in the FBN data set, um, we can see that yes, there is there is a little bit of a yield difference between uh, corn bore uh, corn bore corn and uh, and conventional corn. On corn back to corn, we see about a six bushel an acre difference where the traded corn outperforms conventional corn. Um, and on corn to soybean rotations, we see about a two bushel an acre difference. Okay, so you know that is not insubstantial. Uh, but I do think that that it's interesting because when we compare this the cost of seed, um, I'm not sure that it that it pays for it, and and that's what we show on the right. So on the right, you see the ROI, right? And from an ROI perspective, in spite of the difference in you know the yield drag that that our data shows for conventional corn, the ROI is still there, right? So so growing conventional corn on both corn back to corn situations and corn back to soybean situations, um, we see that there is a a positive ROI. For growing conventional corn. So let's look at the at the last slide here, which is um, another objection that we get, which is that I need my rootworm protection. And again, we're gonna we're gonna dive into this subject. But at a high level, same story as the last slide. Yes, there is a little bit of yield drop off across the millions of acres in, that FBN analyzed. Um, you know, right around seven, eight bushel an acre on corn back to corn, uh, but only about one bushel an acre difference between conventional and, and traded corn uh, on, if you're on a, cr a corn and soybean rotation. Now, how does that affect ROI or net revenue? Uh, well, it's same story, right? But in both cases, um, our data shows that that trade is no longer, no longer paying and that there is a positive ROI to growing conventional corn. So those are just some of the insights that we garnered from high level, right? Looking at millions of acres across the FBN data set. Um, and I, I do think that that that's really interesting. Um, but I think, what does it mean for you? Uh, what does it mean for your farm? Well, I want to unpack that a little bit more and go through it both from a, you know, hearing from other farmers and, uh, and also starting to pencil out what it means when you also take into account the chemical side. So, before we jump into that, I want to uh, I want to play for you guys a recording that we have from a uh, from a presentation that we did about a month ago on this same subject. Um, and Dale Lassick joined us and uh, did a great job explaining his experience growing conventional corn uh, and also the uh, the chemical program that he uses. Uh, so Dale Dale's a farmer in Nebraska, and uh, let's go ahead and, and roll this clip to uh, to hear from Dale. Yeah, I've been growing conventional corn off and on, uh, really since I got out of college, which would be roughly 18 years ago or so. Um, my uh, biggest concern for uh, the traded uh, corn was I was seeing less and less of a return on my investment on my acres. Uh, it, you know, I was seeing weed resistance uh, creeping in and, and as the cost of the traded corn was going up, I think we all saw how corn prices, the seed prices really took a jump when corn reached that uh, astronomical peak of seven or eight dollars per bushel. And what I was seeing was uh, agriculture decided to base its entire economy uh, upon 18 months of high price corn. And then reality brought the price of the commodity that we were growing back to earth and uh, but the seed prices stayed high and the seed prices in many cases were two hundred and fifty dollars per bag or more so I got heavier I had been growing the uh, the traded uh, varieties and had been having luck with them however as uh, as I was looking at return on investment I just decided to give conventional a try and believe me, there were many, many seed uh, salesmen trying to talk me out of it and telling me that my crop was going to fall flat on its face if I did it. So about four years ago, uh, I went back and I planted about two-thirds of my acres to conventional, and uh, I did not see any yield difference. I 
was right at my a uh, average production history on all of my farms. And the chemical program uh, was really, I had been spraying like a Halex mix uh, and spraying my own crops, which is dual Roundup, uh, Callisto, and Atrazine. And I merely took the Roundup out of the system. And uh, grass was not a big issue for me anyway. And uh, I laid down a pre-emerge program of bicep with some balanced flex to it. And on about half of my fields, I did not even have to go in with a respray. And on the fields that I did, I used a Callisto atrazine uh, mix, four ounces of Callisto and uh, and a quart of atrazine, and that had all of the activity on the broadleafs that I needed. And my fields at fall were just as clean as as any traded corn. And I actually did it did a test plot where I had a conventional and traded corn in the test plot, and the test plot was won by an LG number that was a conventional number. Uh, it was 2636 conventional, and it actually won the plot by, I believe, two, two and a half bushels per acre. And uh, that was over all traded and non-traded corn. So it was after that that I just started going field by field and deciding which fields needed the traits, which fields did not need the traits. And a little caveat to that, this year on some corn on corn acres, I planted a Pioneer AcreMax Extra, which is supposed to have all the bug traits available out there. And it was my only field this year that I had earworm issues. And yes, that was corn on corn. Uh, they did not quite rise to the level where it was at the economic threshold of spraying, but it was, it was noticeable where the traded corn had the earworm issues, and like uh, my non-traded or even straight Roundup Ready uh, varieties did not have bug issues. So uh, the conclusion I've come to on my farm is that Monsanto has done a wonderful job of convincing all of us that we can't farm without their technology. When in reality, we were farming without their technology for 100 years before it became available. And it probably is more of a spoiling convenience uh, than a necessity. I've, uh, I've learned that a good pre-emerge program followed by a good uh, broadleaf program of Callisto and Atrazine uh, keeps my fields just as clean. And my return on investment per acre has gone up since I've been doing this. Are there places for traded corn? Absolutely. But uh, if, I can, if I can cut my seed bill in half and still raise the same amount of bushels, uh, I really don't see any downsides to it. So uh, I'm going to have more conventional corn next year. I bought some of the 108-day uh, through the Farmer-to-Farmer uh, -farmer Genetics Network, uh, and, uh, and which is one of the reasons that that brought me here. Alrighty, thank you. Yeah, sorry about that. <clears throat> Getting cut off just a little bit short there, um, but uh, but it, it was good to hear from Dale. We we uh, thought he did a, a great job when he presented for us last time, uh, and decided to to bring it back on. We do have a couple more recordings from farmers. I'm not sure that we'll have time to, to get to those here today, um, but do know that if you're interested in hearing more and hearing more from that webinar, um, that there is a recording available, um, and you can jump back and listen to that. So. As we continue to unpack and talk about, you know, what does this mean from an ROI perspective on my farm? Uh, the next thing I want to jump into is is a kind of case study, if you want to say, or a step-by-step -step ROI example of conventional corn versus traded. So what we're going to do now is we're going to jump through a little calculation that we did. Um, here shortly, you guys will have an ROI calculator that you'll be able to jump in and, and put these numbers in yourself. Um, but this is just a, a broad example that that we've been we've done here at FBN uh, for a per acre basis. How does conventional corn compare to traded corn? Now, how we came about this today was well, we took a uh, some chemical plans that we we put together 
based off feedback from our members, um, members that are both doing conventional corn and members doing traded corn. Um, and, you know, just kind of took a pulse of what we hear from those guys. And then, and then we jumped in and started looking at uh, other parts of the FBN data set. So what is, what is the cost of some of these chemicals that our members told us that they're, they're applying on, uh, on both traded and conventional corn? Um, and, and what are they paying for their seed? So we, we you know, took the average triple stack uh, per unit corn uh, price and we broke it down to a per acre level. Um, and that's what you see on the screen here. And then we did the same thing when it comes to yield, which is a revenue slide that, that we'll talk about in a little bit. Now, as I go through each one of these, I want to, to just talk through, you know, kind of the thinking behind it and, uh, and how we came about these. So first slide here, what you see is comparing conventional corn to traded corn for two seasons, right? The pre-plant season and the at planting season. Now, I want to just underscore that first one because for, for pre-plant, I put kind of a, you know, the answer that I got from a lot of farmers, but is, is that if you have a clean, a clean seed bed, I don't know that you need a pre-plant. Now, you know, you just heard from, from Dale. Dale is in a situation where he, he does things a little bit differently. He does uh, a pre-plant and then he comes back and he may have to apply something on about half of his acres afterwards. Um, but most of the other farmers that we talk to, you know, as long as you have a clean seed bed, be it um, from whatever way you're managing the weeds in your situation, um, then a lot of guys aren't doing a pre-plant. They're, they're on a one-pass system for both conventional corn and traded corn. You know, it's interesting, my dad is a farmer in Northeast Indiana and uh, has grown traded corn for as long as I can remember. And, uh, you know, as we were starting to talk about F2F genetics, I, you know, asked him what chemical program he's currently using and was surprised to learn that he was using a conventional uh, herbicide plan. Uh, he was, he's been using um, an Acuron type system uh, for the last couple of years and hasn't even been using the Roundup trait, um, even though he was paying for it in all of his seed. So I think uh, that's a situation that a lot of guys are in today because of, uh, because of resi weed, weed resistance issues that they, that they see. And uh, fortunately, there's some really good chemistries out there uh, that, you know, whether you do it pre-plant or post-plant, uh, can really help, can really manage your weeds with a single pass. So with that being said, let's jump into the next piece, right? Which is uh, at planting. I'm oh, sorry, back, back a slide, Dan. Uh, let's talk about at planting. Uh, what is your cost of, of your seed? And do I need to put an insecticide with it? So on the right, you see triple stack corn, right? And that's our per acre cost of triple stack corn in the F F2F genetics network or in the FBN network. Now, the good thing about um, about triple stack, and this is a positive, right, is that it, it has rootworm protection. Um, so, you know, you don't need to put an insecticide, in most cases, you don't need to put an insecticide in furrow when you plant it. Um, now you can see the price there, $104 an acre uh, is, is pretty significant, especially when you compare it to the F2F corn seed. So F2F corn is a conventional corn, it's $105 a unit, but it does not have the rootworm trait right? It, uh, it is exposed to that. So <clears throat> the good thing though is that there's a re there's really good options for insecticides for you to put in furrow. So the product that we, you know, are pulling our customers came up with was a bifenthrin LFR. <clears throat> and what the LFR stands for is it means liquid fertilizer. Um, and it, it allows you to put, um, to put this, this product in with your, your pop-up liquid fertilizer. Um, and uh, and not have issues. So do be careful when you if you buy bifenthrin, you need to make sure that you get an LFR or um, LFC is another thing that that you might hear hear it called liquid fertilizer compatible. Um, and we do have product available on FBN Direct. Now, what is the cost of that product? Uh, well, per gallon it's ninety something um, for the cash price, and if you break that down to a per acre cost, came right to four ninety nine. Um, and you know, that, I thought that price was was so interesting. I actually asked our the, the guy who does the pricing at FBN whether or not that was intentional. Um, apparently, it was total coincidence. But 4.99 an acre is our is the current price that we have for uh, an insecticide that you put in furrow. So I think you know right off the bat, uh, conventional corn, specifically F2F corn, is at a big advantage um, when you uh, when you compare what what do I have put into my product so far. So that's hey, hey Brent. Hey Brent. There's a question that 
there's a question that came in that I think is relevant right at this point. If a person does not have a clean seed bed, are they able to use glyphosate before the conventional corn? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, glyphosate itself does not have a residual. So, um, you know, as long as you put it in pre-plant, you can use that to to manage your weeds. Um, in, sec in fact, I think, um, you know, Dale mentioned that a little bit. Now, Dale, Dale uses a, a similar product that you'll see here in a second, but he throws some Roundup in with it. Um, and creates, you know, a product that he goes and does pre-plant to uh, to make sure he has a clean seed bed prior to planting. So good question. All right, so let's jump to the next slide then. So, you know, we're already at a good advantage pre-planting. Uh, let's talk about post-planting. And, and this slide is where it really shows that now's the perfect time to try out conventional corn. Because as you can see here, the chemistry is not different. For most of the farmers that I pulled, for a lot of the agronomists we, we brought in to talk about with here as well, the chemical plans are, are nearly the same. Now on my dad's farm, he does, he does Acuron, um, which is a lot of the products that you see here, uh, just put into one mix. But there's, there's many different ways you can come up with this, this same program. And in fact, I thought it was really interesting. I, I probably talked to a half dozen farmers um, in the last couple of days, and nearly all of them used a similar program uh, for, for their chemistry. Uh, with a with a s metolachlor with atrazine type product and then uh, a mesotrione added to the mix as well. So these products have have really good luck. They can be both put on pre-plant or post planting. Um, you know what what we have have kind of heard from a lot of farmers that of what they're doing is they are putting on this tank mix um, sometime right in between planting. Uh, or right after planting, but before V5. And I will say it's really important that you get this product put on uh, before V5, um, or else there could be could be some uh, some negative effects on the crop. So it's important that you get this on early. Um, so hopefully you're in a situation where you you plant, and then you can quickly turn around and get this product put on. And and the great thing about this this mix that a lot of farmers have have suggested to us is that it does have some residual. And many times, if you can get it on post-planting, um, but before V5, that's that's how you pull off a single-pass system, right? Um, because by the time this residual starts to wear off, a lot of the corn's started to canopy, um, and a lot of guys are having really good success with a single-pass system um, using using you know the program that that we've laid out here. So, I think that's that's a really good sign for from a from a herbicide perspective. Um, Let's also talk about insecticide though. Okay, so you know, once once the, the corn is up on the traded corn, you a lot of times have a corn bore trait, um, which which makes it, you know, so the bugs don't don't want that corn. Um, you don't have that with with F2F corn or with conventional corn. So, you know, there might be situations where you would need need to do insecticide. Now, I'll say that I talked to, like I said, a half dozen or so farmers in the last couple of days. And not a single one of them had had to worry about this in the last couple of years. One of the the positives of of so many of our so many farmers doing triple stack and traded corn over the last couple of years is that the corn borer issue has really is subsided, um, and it's not a, nearly the issue that it has been, um, or as it as it once was. In fact, I would I would argue that the traits worked. The traits did their job, and uh, a lot of time the corn borer. Has, has is not nearly the issue that it used to be. Um, now the positive of that is that now a lot of farmers are getting by without even going back and adding an insecticide treatment uh, once the once the crop is is brought up. Now in the next couple slides here later we'll talk about kind of a doomsday scenario and what happens if if a corn borer outbreak occurs um, and and we'll see the effect that has on the ROI. But I think this slide right here is the the perfect example of why it's a great time to try out conventional corn. Um, because you know the, the farmers we talk to, they're not cha changing their herbicide plans, uh, they're not changing their their insecticide plans um, either. So let's jump to the next slide and let's start start breaking this down from an ROI perspective. So with this slide, what what I first have here is I have what is the total seed and chemical cost per acre? Okay, and you can see here this is adding up, um, you know both both the the seed per acre costs and the chemical per acre costs. Um, you can see that number listed there. Um, you can see that that with conventional corn, you're at a, at a huge advantage prior to yield. Now, 
let's look at revenue per acre. Revenue per acre, we talked about this on an earlier slide, across the entire network, traded corn outperforms, uh, outperforms conventional corn by about three bushel an acre. Now, I would argue that um, that's, there's a lot of factors that went into that. Um, because if you really think about what a trait does, a trait is not what brings you top end yield, right? A trait is what makes your crops maybe a little bit easier to manage, um, maybe helps out with, with you know, some chemicals, but, but we just talked about that. Um, but, but I want to underscore this, this idea that traits do not bring yield, it's genetics that bring yield. So if you're able to go out and find high quality conventional corn, which is what we think we have with F2F genetics corn, uh, then you really should not see a yield drop off. Um, if you can manage your pests, you should you should see equal or, or better yield coming out of conventional corn just just because of how traits are integrated. Now, um, so for this example, let's go ahead and use the high level number of you know traded corn outperforming, um, and then let's look at price per bushel. Now, in this scenario, I did not include a premium. Now, there are non-GMO corn premiums that are out there and if you're able to get your hands on one that's fantastic um, and uh, I will I will give a heads up that Farmers Business Network will have some conventional corn or some some non-GMO corn contracts available this year um, but let's assume that you don't get that let's assume that there's not a premium for growing non-GMO corn and let's still see how that affects the numbers okay so you can see revenue per acre traded corn does win by a few bucks because of the additional uh, yield that that our data shows that they they have, but when you look at net revenue, there's a clear winner. Okay, so net revenue in this scenario here is revenue minus your seed and chemical costs. So we're not taking into account other other factors that should all be the same depending on traded or conventional. Um, but you can see it's a clear winner, right? Forty-seven dollars an acre um, is what is what our you know this quick situation or this quick scenario shows. Um, and, and that's all driven because the savings in seed, right? Our, our seed being $105 a unit is uh, significantly less than traded. It's significantly less than other conventional corn products on the market. And, uh, and that's why you see su such a substantial um, ROI difference there um, in, this, in this scenario. So I know what, you know, I'd be thinking if I were in your shoes is that, well, we, you know, we made these numbers look as good as we possibly could. This is for the stars aligning perfect situation um, so let's jump into the doomsday scenario okay so on the next slide I have what happens if things go south right what happens if there's a weed outbreak let's say that there's a huge grass issue the chemical plan that I talked about didn't didn't work didn't get the job done uh, let's say that corn borer occurs what what does that do to my bottom line well up here on the screen you can see some example prices that that we have so Let's talk about weed outbreak. Okay, so if, if, if there is an issue with weeds, it's probably going to happen. A lot, feedback we get a lot of times happening with grass these days. Um, and, you know, glyphosate, that's one of its the things that it still is really effective on. So on traded corn, if you have a grass outbreak, you can just, just run over it with glyphosate and, uh, and it'll do the job. And you can see glyphosate is, is really affordable, <laughs> really cheap, um, and, and uh, really good, good price there. On, the other side, if you have conventional corn, you can't you can't go and spray uh, the the affordable glyphosate. You're going to have to go find another option. So the option that we've thrown out here is an ascent. Um, you know, I, I don't have a great price on that. Some feedback that we got from farmers is that it's around nine dollars an acre if you have to go down this route. So not insignificant. That is a a, a big number. Um, but I will add that. Most guys have their, have as long as you have your weeds under control, you don't have to go down this route. We have another farmer uh, that we heard from in our last webinar that's in uh, in Minnesota. And he made a comment that he's he's bought a scent the last three years. He's kept it on his shelf just in case he had an outbreak. And uh, fortunately he hasn't had to use it. So the last three years he's had it and he's he hasn't had to use that product. Um, and, and we hear that a lot as we talk to farmers. So I, I still wanna put it out here in case there is you know, worst case scenario, there are other options that you can go in and, and, uh, and manage your grass, um, you know, after an outbreak. All right, so let's talk about insects. Let's say there's a corn borer issue that occurs. Um, you know, once again, if you have traded, you should be covered. Um, although we've heard reports lately of, of uh, you know, maybe that, 
some resistance building to that trait. Um, but you know, you're not going to have that trait with conventional. So you are, if there is an outbreak, you are going to have to go back and, and spray that. Now, the number I show here is is for again by Fenthrin. Um, it is a product that can be can be sprayed over the top, um, and the price is around 285 an acre, which uh, you know still a, a solid price. Now I will say that that's probably not the only cost associated, right? If you do have to go in and spray for an inse insect outbreak, there's additional costs of you know, your sprayer and your time, and and I, I want to take that into consideration. Uh, but I do want to add that. You know, a lot of times if guys go in and spray by Fenthrin because there is an outbreak, they're pro they're th going to throw a fungicide in with it, um, and uh, there's probably going to be some upside upside there. Um, or some guys go the other way around. If they're already always spraying an insect uh, a fungicide, they're a lot of times thrown by Fenthrin in anyways, just to, just to be there just in case, um, because because that cost is is so reasonable. So. Those are your two doomsday scenarios, a weed outbreak, a post-emergence insect out, outbreak. Uh, so what effect does that have on, on your net revenue? Um, and, and you can see here, even though there is an additional nine, 10 bucks that, that get thrown into the mix with this scenario, conventional corn still ROIs. And, and that's the story that we're trying to, trying to show here. Um, you know, we're in, we're in a unique situation um, because of, corn borer being subsided because of Roundup resistance issues that are in the field, the ROI is there. And uh, I think that as long as you can manage your pests because of the, the seed savings that you have, you're going to be in a really good position from a net revenue standpoint um, if, you, uh, if you go down the route of trying conventional corn. Okay, let's jump to the next slide. All right, so that's that's penciling out the ROI. And again, I'll have a calculator here. We'll talk a little bit at the end about other ways that you could dive into this and look into it from, from your farm's perspective. Uh, but I do wanna do a short pitch or, or discussion about F2F Genetics Seed. So F2F Genetics, we launched our seed company back in August. Um, and it's uh, it, it came out of, um, you know, really feedback from farmers. We, we at FBN have always, been in the seed business in a way in that we have, you know, we help farmers choose their seed. We show farmers what seed is costing. Um, and we get a lot of feedback from farmers asking us to, to do something, to, to help out with seed costs that, that were seemingly going out of control. So we launched F2F Genetic Seed back in August. Uh, it's been an exciting few months. We've had, uh, we're off to a really great start. Um, and for this year, we have corn and soybeans um, at the moment. So we have uh, we have five hybrids of corn, which we're going to talk about here. Um, and we have, we did have four, four varieties of soybeans. We've sold out of two. So we have two varieties of soybeans available today. Um, and, and this is an ever expanding portfolio. So we are going to have some other products this year. We're going to have some shorter season products going all the way down to 78 day corn. Um, and we're going to have some longer season than what we're showing here going all the way up to, uh, to 116 day. So um, let's jump into uh, to the products that we have available today um, and talk about these. So first of all, we have 102 day. I'm not going to dive into this here because uh, there's lots of other ways that you can you can learn about about each of our specific hybrids that we have. Um, if you visit f2fgenetics.com, um, you can go and and see a video that, that goes through each of our products, um, and you can you can really unpack what we have here. 102 day is uh, is a great product. It is uh, it's definitely more of one of your racehorse type varieties. It's a fixed year, um, and uh, if you look there at the at the performance, um, it's a it's a high performer. Um, you know, in our plot trial data, which uh, you know I'll mind you that uh, I'll warn you that plot trial data is different from real world world data. Um, so you know expect expect some some differences from what results you actually see. But this product held out really well. Um, you know, 220 at uh, mean uh, does a little bit better east of I-35 compared to west of I-35, um, but really a high-performing, uh, you know, offensive type hybrid um, that we have available. So let's jump to the next one. All right, the next product that we have that I want to talk about is the 106 day, and really a similar story here. Um, you know, all of our products are not just shooting for high yield. We also um, strive to have really good disease ratings for for our hybrids that we selected. Really good standability. Um, you know, we were out in the fields with these shortly before harvest, and um, 
you know, these products were still standing strong compared to some of the well-known varieties and hybrids that you guys are, are already familiar with. Um, so the 106 days, really good root strength, um, stays intact late in season, but you can see there's still some really good um, yield performance there um, on that product. This is one that does actually do, do better um, if you kind of stay in the narrow band of the Corn Belt um, and uh, doesn't do as well if you go, go too far north or south of, of your typical 106 day hybrid. All right, so let's look at the 108. All right, the 108 day. Now this is this is the uh, you know the the only product in our portfolio today that I would call or consider a defensive hybrid. Um, and uh, and but there is I wouldn't call it a true defensive because there is still a lot of of yield upside. But it is a semi flex. Um, so this product um, does a little bit better in uh, in lower productivity soil because there is some flex to the ear. Um, but uh, it is it's it's a great choice for corn on corn. Um, and uh, it does what does does well in those lower lower populations, like I mentioned. So you can see there from our, our plot trials, this has been a really high performer, and we're excited about this product. Okay, let's let's jump to our 110. All right, the 110 day. So this one's great uh, in zone. It's really good at, if you're in that 110 day zone. Really good disease package with this product. Um, it is a semi fix. There's a lot of, of high, you know, high end yield potential with this product. Now, this one we actually have some side by sides compared to uh, some decalve and some pioneer options. Uh, this comes out of our, our plot trial data. Um, but you can see that this, this product stands out well with some of the well known brands that you guys are familiar with. Um, and uh, definitely recommend that you, you check out, like I said, F2F Genetics and check out our spec sheets to dive some more into these. Um, but this this is a really high performer. This is one that uh, is going to be on our farm um, in Northeast Indiana this year. Let's look at the 112. All right, the 112 day. Um, so this is another exciting one. This is one that uh, is really good dual purpose. So if you're in a situation where you're growing for, for silage, um, this is a great silage option that we have. Um, there is still some some good yield potential, as you see there. Um, and uh, and once again, really good disease packages with this product. Okay, so that's our portfolio that we have today. I know I, I quickly went through those. Again, I recommend that you go and, and dive in and learn more on F2FGenetics.com. Um, so let's talk about programs. And again, I see I see quite a few questions are coming in. Continue to throw questions in there, and uh, we'll get to those at the end. Um, now, Dan, can you uh, exit out and? rerun this slide because it's, it's a little bit out of date here. Yeah, I think just close out the uh, presentation and, and reopen it. I had to make a change probably after you started it, maybe. Okay, there we go. Um, so uh, here's here's the programs that we have available today. Now, when we designed these programs, we, we really wanted to um, a encourage guys to to make that jump to F2F Genetics here in our initial launch year, um, and and that's our Trailblazer program, which we'll talk about. Um, but we also wanted, you know, we know that a lot of farmers are considering conventional for the first time. We know that they're expecting, you know, incremental chemical costs, which um, you know there are there are a few incremental chemical costs. Um, so that's why we have have uh, the Unbundle offer that we have. So um, what are our programs this year? Well, first of all, we have $105 and $31 uh, soybeans, so $105 a unit for corn, $31 a unit for soybeans. That's our current pricing that we have. This pricing will stay eligible um, until uh, November 16th. Uh, but in addition to that, we have 0% financing. So one of the main value adds that FBN is offering on our input side this year is, is this 0% financing. It's a really exciting offer that we think is, is one of the best in the industry. And uh, if you're approved for finance, you uh, are eligible for 0% financing, zero payments, zero interest until December 1st of 2019, um, which, you know, we know that's a, an important thing for a lot of you guys um, as, we're, as we're managing cash flow issues in this current, you know, farm economy. Um, so the 0% interest is available through on any purchases, any seed purchases made um, until uh, December 20th of this year. Um, and uh, it's a really exciting program that we, I suggest you guys check out. So those are our base programs. Anybody's eligible for those, um, as long as you're approved for financing. 
Um, but we also, you know, like I said, we want to help guys try out conventional corn. So that's why we have the Unbundle program. The Unbundle program, as it stands today, is, is for any customer that purchases 40 units of corn. And what we'll do is we're going to offer an, an un, what we're calling the Unbundle coupon for anybody that, that makes that purchase by November 30th of this year. Now, what is the Unbundle? Uh, well, you know, it's it's kind of a play on, uh, you know, the rebate system that's currently out in the market today, right? You guys are surely aware of uh, rebates that occur if you bundle corn and corn and your chemical products that we have. Um, and we wanted to see if we could do a better bundle, um, a better option than what's currently in the market. And that's why we have have it called the Unbundle. So with the Unbundle program, you uh, you purchase, if you purchase um, 40 units by the end of this month, then you will get a $500 coupon added to your FBN Direct Store. And uh, that'll be uh, able to be put on any of your uh, chemical purchase that you make through FBN Direct. So it's not product specific. We encourage you to go check out the best products that are available um, that, that meet your needs the best, that are the best price uh, for what you want. And uh, on any purchase over $20,000, you can put this uh, $500 coupon towards that. So that's the Unbundle program. On the other side, we have the Trailblazer. And the Trailblazer is a really exciting program that we have right now. This is for guys who make a 500 acre commitment to F2F in our initial launch year. Um, you can do that either by buying 200 units of corn um, or you can buy 80 units of corn and then fill up the rest with 280 units of soybeans to get to that 500 acre threshold. Um, now this, this program doesn't have a date deadline. Uh, this program expires. Uh, whenever we fill up 200 spots and, and I'll, uh, I'll throw in that those spots are filling up. So if you're interested in making, you know, a significant commitment, definitely worth it to go grab and become a trailblazer. Now, what are the benefits of being a trailblazer? Well, first of all, we have exclusive pricing still available to our trailblazers. So our initial launch pricing, which was $99 corn, $29 soybeans, is still available to, tra to trailblazers. Uh, that was the program we set out from the start, and the deal's still still on the table. Um, so, so price savings uh, on a per unit basis are still there. But there's also a three thousand dollar unbundled coupon. So, three thousand dollars off of any twenty thousand dollar chemical purchase um, is a uh, is really significant savings. And I recommend that you guys, uh, if you're if you're looking to make a big commitment, definitely jump up and be a trailblazer so that you can get um, that added savings off of a future chemical purchase. Now the last benefit of a trailblazer is uh, first access to our 2020 hybrids. So we are actively working on our portfolio for next year and uh, we're really excited with how it's shaping out. And uh, we're gonna have a few units of our, of our 2020 hybrids that we'll be able to, uh, to launch to you guys here in this initial year. So those are our programs that we have, both our Unbundle and our Trailblazer side. Um, definitely if, you're, if you wanna learn more, throw a question in or uh, follow up with us after this, uh, after this uh, webinar. Okay, let's go to the next slide. All right, so let's talk about next steps, right? We just, we just unpacked conventional corn ROI. We talked about the offering of the F2F Genetics Network. What are, what are some next steps that you can do? Um, and you know, I, I'm excited. We have, we have a, an offering this year that's new to FBN. Um, that's called our crop plans, and uh, I've asked Neil McCormick to join us today. Neil is uh, the mastermind behind the crop plans that we have this year, um, and and what a I'll let him explain it. But essentially, we, we want to have an option for you guys to really deep dive into this ROI. So Neil, if you could just kind of give a two-minute pitch on a crop plan and what farmers, uh, people that are listening, could do to uh, get a crop plan done for their farm. Yeah. So can you you can uh, hear me? All right. Yep. Yep. Okay, yeah, so the, the crop plan, essentially what we're doing is we are uh, going through you. It's a consultation you would do with your account executive. Uh, you just go through, tell them, hey, this is what I'm planting for the year. Uh, these are the, this is the fertilizer and the rate I use, and then the, the chemical products and the rate you use. And then we would uh, uh, take all the data, <clears throat> pull in all the, the, the numbers from the network as far as the pricing of all the products. Uh, then you'd punch in a projected uh, you know what you want to sell the crop for your projected yields uh, through all that info together in about a 25 to 40 minute session and then that would at the end of it you would get a you know a cost projection on what all your chemicals are going to cost what your fertilizer is going to cost uh, what your projected revenue is uh, and then it would also uh, spit out an ROI 
on the per acre or profit, um, just on the variable um, inputs like Brand was showing before, but uh, would show you what your projected uh, cost per acre, um, revenue per acre, and then your net revenue per acre uh, just on the variable inputs would be. And then a lot of farmers will use that and then put a, you know, put an acre comparison or project out. Uh, if you want to compare two different chemical plans or, uh, you know, tweak your acres and just see what it takes to make conventional work for you versus the, uh, uh, versus different traded products. So just a really, really simple, easy process to go through that makes a, you know, what typically, typically can be pretty laborious, a lot of work to sit down and figure out all those numbers. We've got a rep that can, can uh, come out to you. We have a tool that's pretty easy to use that we're beta testing this year. Eventually, uh, potentially will go into the product itself so you can do it on your own. Uh, down the road, not <clears throat> something we're uh, looking into. So, uh, yeah, if you want to put some hard numbers to something, you know, you have our sample numbers. We have the crop plans really a way to go down. Uh, put uh, put all the hard numbers you want to test out into a into an analysis to compare some scenarios and uh, see what's going to work out for you. So, just a way to personalize a lot of the stuff we've been talking about uh, throughout the webinar. So, that's probably as far as what's regarding uh, uh, tonight's content. That's probably the most relevant. Uh, way you go about it so and, and in addition it would also give you all the you know the chemicals it would give you an inventory list of how many bags of corn you'd need how many uh, gallons of chemical pounds of chemical uh, pounds of fertilizer uh, so then you have a, an inventory list that makes it easy to uh, uh, you know uh, get an order get an order in on the preseason uh, volumes and that kind of thing so hoping you do all the easy math in addition uh, to all the you know the ROI analysis we talked about. So a lot of a lot of purposes, a lot of value in that. So uh, just reach out to your AE if you want to get one uh, schedule lined out today. So yeah, any any questions? Or is that uh, uh, what you're looking for there, Brent? I think that should pretty well sum up what we're. That was yeah. great. Thank you, Neil. And yeah, you know, if anybody is a member or a potential member and uh, would like to get a crop plan, just reach out to your local rep, and uh, we'll get we'll get that lined out. Okay. Cool. Good deal. All right, uh, let's jump to uh, to the next slide. So we do have a poll that I wanted to do. Um, so actually, a couple polls. Um, one is uh, is one that we just were kind of curious on, and the other one was a little bit more applicable to to this presentation. So um, and again, continue to throw questions in. We'll get to questions here in just a minute. Um, so Dan, why don't we throw up the poll on uh, on on uh, kind of their interest in F two F genetics? and uh you know what they're what they're looking for um from that perspective so just curious to see you know if you have any interest in f2f genetics and uh basically what you're what you're thinking from that perspective so let you guys answer that poll question here for a few minutes Alrighty, uh, thank you guys for answering that. Let's uh, check out the results. All right, that's uh, that's pretty well in line with what we've been thinking uh, in the past. So we do we do have opportunities to partner with us uh, from a breeding perspective and from a partner perspective. Uh, so we'll be reaching out to you guys uh, with regards to that. And thank you for that. Uh, now the other poll, I, like I said, is a little bit more just interesting to us. Where you know the the current ag economic state is uh, is you know, made the outlook for an ROI for beans look a little bit different than it did a year ago. Um, and uh, we've heard we've heard different stories of what people are doing to change up their their crop rotations um, for next year. So let's throw up the question on whether or not you're planning to grow more or less corn in your next growing season. So my corn acres next year will increase, decrease, or stay the same. Yeah, really interesting results of this one. All right, Dan, let's let's throw up the results of this one. Yeah, that's uh, that's that's about in line with what with what we'd expect. I, I would say that we probably had been hearing rumors of more people increasing uh, than what than what uh, you know we showed through this poll. 
Um, but, uh, but actually I think it's good. I think the folks that are staying the same, if they're on a good crop rotation, that's a, uh, that's probably the right thing to do for the long term, right? Um, as, as we know, the markets are ever evolving. Okay. All right. Um, so I want to, uh, follow, just throw out one more slide and then we'll get to questions where, you know, if you are interested in, in ordering seed today or learning more, we do have, uh, folks available to answer, answer phone calls. So, um, if you'd like that, just go ahead and, and give us a shout right now. Um, otherwise, expect us to reach out to you guys in short order. Um, but I want to jump into questions here. So I've seen a handful of questions come through, a lot of really good ones. And uh, let's talk about them. Okay, so so I see here that one of our uh, one of the attendees says says that conventional corn was the highest yielding, most profitable this year, and that they're hooked. Uh, so we like to hear that. And uh, and obviously, you know, that's what our our data is showing. And, uh, and exciting to hear, hear that real world showing the same thing. Um, okay, uh, one question that I already answered individually, but it was a good one, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about it here is, uh, at what population are we calculating this seed cost? Um, and are they similar seeds? So let's talk about seed costs first. Um, I'm calculating this at 32,000 seeds per acre. Um, I just did a, a simple divide the unit of seed cost by 2.5. Um, so assuming that uh, an, a unit of corn would go to two and a half acres is, is how I use my calculations. Um, so obviously if you're in a situation where you're using higher population, um, that's going to uh, to make the ROI look better. Um, if you're doing lower populations, then it's it's gonna make it look a little bit worse. Okay. Um, now, how are we comparing the seeds? I, I didn't get down to that level of comparing the seeds. Instead, what I did was I took the average price of F2F genetics corn and uh, compared that to the average price of triple stack corn. Um, so we just looked at it from a high level, what's the across the board average. So obviously that price will vary um, case by case. And uh, I recommend, you know, as we work and get this calculator out for you guys to make that math uh, work specifically for you. Okay, so good questions there. Um, Another question here about is a is a more aggressive fertilizer program required when planting conventional corn? Um, and uh, you know the feedback that we've gotten is that no, the the fertilizer program that you use, um, it, you know the fertilizer you use is really dependent on the underlying genetics, and uh, you know the underlying genetics of corn of conventional versus traded corn um, should be you know pretty similar, and uh, you should not need to use a more aggressive fertilizer program. Uh, when planting conventional because the, the fact that there's a trait really just just helps you out from a management perspective. Okay. I have a question here about F2F seeds in Colorado. Um, so that's a that's a question that's near and true to me because I'm, I'm a, I live in Colorado. Um, I will say that you know in talking with folks in Colorado I'd say that our the range of products that we currently have available um, in many cases are not uh, a great fit, especially if you're in kind of, you know, the Northeast uh, kind of corn area of Colorado. Um, we, you know, the, the shortest season one that we have is 102 day. Um, and I'm not sure that from what I've heard from guys in that region, that that might be a little bit too long for what they're, what they're currently growing in that pocket. Um, and, uh, but I will say that if, if that, if that maturity range is too long for you, we do have a nice portfolio of shorter season ones that we'll be releasing soon. Um, and, uh, we'll have them at the same price that we're talking about here today. Um, and, uh, we'll be excited to follow up with you and, and see if we can get some of those, uh, some of the new hybrids that we're releasing onto your farm for still this next growing season. Okay. So stay tuned on that. Um, can yeah, we will be sending out a recording of this presentation afterwards, um, and uh, you know we'll send it to all of you guys that attended as well, so that you can share. Um, appreciate that. Uh, question about our soybeans and what population do we recommend for planting on our soybeans? You know the the, the answer that we're going to give for that is really just plant um, plant what works best for you, and and depending on your soil type, that's that's a question that's hard hard to answer because every every soil type is a little bit different. And uh, what we're gonna recommend is that our beans that we offer are gonna be similar to, um, you know, the beans that you're currently planting, assume, assuming that the 
the maturity range is the same. So just plant whatever population works best um, for your farm, and uh, and and we'll go go from there. Um, from a corn perspective, same same situation. Plant plant whatever uh, population works best for you, uh, but do know that we have some hybrids that do better um, if you push push the population and uh, some that um, do better on lower popula populations. Okay. Um, Okay, yeah, continue to ask questions. I'll stick around as long as you guys would like. Um, I appreciate all the questions that we've gotten so far. Um, so if you have other ones, we'll stick around. Um, but otherwise, just wanna thank you guys all, all for attending. Hey Brent, this is Ron. Uh, one more question: Is it uh, too late to uh, be able to attend Farmer to Farmer in December? Yeah, no, great, great question. So, um, you know, we we hold a a event in Omaha, Nebraska. We this will be, I believe, our fourth Farmer to Farmer, and uh, it's uh, it's an event that we put on um, that we we strive to make it be the the best the best farmer facing or farmer focused. Uh, convention or event in the industry um, it is a uh, it's an it's really just for it's for our members to to learn about how can I you know better manage uh, you know the acres that I have um, so it, partially inspirational so you can see there we have some keynote speakers um, that are uh, a lot of guys that you've probably heard of um, and our our our, um, our theme for this year is take control so we have uh, Captain Soliberg fellow Boilermaker who uh, who you know landed that? If you remember, he landed the plane a couple years ago onto the Hudson River. Um, and he's going to talk about taking control of that situation, um, and we're going to be uh, there'll be a lot of different th things about that theme. Um, now, in addition to just inspirational type stuff, we do have uh, a series of speakers, farmers, guys from the industry, um, other folks that are really going to get into the agronomic side and uh, talk about what they're doing to help out um, help their farm be more profitable. And, uh, and that'll be exciting to hear, hear from uh, some of the farmers that you see on the screen here right now. Uh, so this event is, like I said, it's in Omaha. It's at the, uh, used, formerly called the Quest Center uh, there, or the CenturyLink Center um, in downtown Omaha. Uh, it is held from December 12th to the 14th. And uh, all of our members are free to attend. Um, all of our, all of our uh, seed customers, We'll uh, we'll we'll make sure that you get comp to the with the hotel if you uh, if you are able to attend farmer to farmer. Okay, so so definitely if you're interested, you can register at farmer to farmer ag, and uh, definitely want you guys to to check it out, and hopefully we'll get a chance to meet you at farmer to farmer. Alrighty. Uh, any other any other questions? Um, it looks like uh, looks like the questions have kind of slowed down here. So uh, with that being said, thank you all again for joining us. I know that it's a busy time of year for you, and uh, appreciate you uh, coming to check us out. And uh, we hope to hear from you again soon. So thank you.